Hi, in this video I've got a budget handheld oscilloscope and multimeter combo for review. This is Zoe ZT702S, which was provided to me by Zotac. Since it was just released, there are not that many sellers selling it just yet, but I did a quick scan on the internet and it seems you can get this meter for just around $60 from AliExpress and Timu at the moment. I'll share some of the Zotac provided links in the video description below, and while you are at it, you can check out their other products as well. At the $60 price point, it is obviously aimed at the budget market. All the handheld oscilloscopes I have reviewed so far all cost at least three times as much. So if the ZT702S meets its spec 10 MHz bandwidth, which we'll find out shortly, it would be a great entry-level handheld meter. Also, it has a 10,000 counts multimeter built in. The box it came in with does not have the model number printed on it, as you can see here. My guess is that there probably will be multiple versions in the future for this uh, digital oscilloscope here. In the soft pouch the 702S comes in, besides the meter itself, you also have this probe. And the probe is rated for 60 MHz, which is more than plenty, as the meter itself is only rated for 10 MHz. You also get this uh, printed user manual, some probe leads, by the look of it, it's uh, pretty standard, and a thermal couple, and a USB charging cable here. Presumably this is also for data link as well. And by the way, in case you are wondering about the size of the ZT702S, it is about the same size as the standard multimeter. As you can see, I have an ANA70 by the side here for comparison. And it's definitely quite a bit smaller compared to the O1 HDS200 series. And of course, it weighs much lighter as well. The stickers over the current jacks reminds you that you probably should pay attention to what measurement range before doing your actual measurements. Let's uh, remove this. And by the look of it, we still have this uh, protective cover on. Let's uh, remove that as well. And it booted up really quickly, and by the look of it, it enters the oscilloscope mode by default. And uh, by the way, the ZT702S has only a single channel, as you can see here. Again, this is for the designated entry-level market segment. Let's see, how do we change to multimeter mode? I think I just pressed the mode button. Yep, and it changes to multimeter mode, and you can see we have the old measurement, the current measurement, and what did it say? It says, uh, let's come back here. Oh, it doesn't say it again. Okay, we'll have to take a look at what it says. But anyway, it's warning you probably the jacks you have to use are the current ones instead of the voltage ones. Anyway, so let's uh, take a look and then you have the current measurement. So that's pretty intuitive. And let's power it off and uh, power it back on again. Yeah, and it appears that the initial mode the meter boots into is always the oscilloscope mode, and you will just have to switch it to the multimeter mode if you intend to use the multimeter. While we're in the oscilloscope mode, let's put in some test signals and take a closer look. And for tests here, I'm going to use my O1DGE2070 to generate the test signals. Let's start with a 1 MHz sinusoidal, and right now the Amplitude I set is at 1 volt peak to peak. So let's turn on the output. Let me use the auto range to capture the signal here. Well, as you can see, it captured the signal with no problem. The amplitude is a little bit of a small, so let's uh, increase it. You can see the control here. You can use the left or right to adjust the time base and up and down to adjust the vertical settings. As you can see that the controls are very intuitive and they are definitely more intuitive compared to those on O1 or the Hantac handheld oscilloscopes. And let's take a look at the controls we have here. Let's see, move. I assume that's uh, to move the waveform. Yep, it's exactly as what it said. And uh, hold and save. Stop, okay. What does the save mean? Let's uh, press and hold. Oh, okay. So this actually saves the screenshot. That's actually very neat. I really like this feature. 
it can save me a lot of time when doing reviews, as sometimes I do need to capture the waveforms. With this dedicated save functionality, it will save you a lot of time. And trigger, I assume this is to adjust the trigger level. Yep. And that's to adjust the trigger level. And uh, AC, DC, this is change the input coupling. So let me add a little bit of offset and take a look here. Uh, let's add 0.1 volt at a time. Yeah, no problem. And that's this uh, AC-DC coupling. Let's uh, change it back to AC and uh, let's try that again. It must be a very high input capacitance or something because I don't know if you see this. When I switch to a different offset level, it takes quite a bit of time for the waveform to be settled again. We also have the manual button here. And this one, you can also, again, change the AC-DC coupling and change the trigger mode. Let's see what trigger mode we have. We have normal, single, auto. And uh, to normal mode, let's uh, trigger it. Okay, no problem. And of course, we can trigger on rising edge or falling edge. No problem. And we can change the probe to be times one, times 10, times one. Okay, so there are only two choices. So far, I really like the design. Everything is very logically laid out. And let's put in a few more waveforms in and take a look at uh, how it turns out on this oscilloscope. So let's uh, change it to a square wave. Here's a triangular wave. And uh, let's uh, do a arbitrary waveform here. This is the noise. And let's change one to the arbitrary waveform. And here we have a amplitude modulated signal. Let me tell you what, this actually is quite impressive. You can see that we triggered on the signal with no problem at all. Sometimes even scopes with better specs have a hard time triggering on the amplitude modulated signal here. And this one doesn't seem to have any problems with this signal whatsoever. And here is a frequency modulated signal with a carrier frequency of 100 kilohertz and uh, the modulated frequency is 100 hertz with a frequency deviation of uh, 9 kilohertz. And you can see that the oscilloscope is really responsive. And you can definitely see the modulated waveform that is shifting around on the scope. Of course, you do see that once in a while we have a glitch here and there, and that's probably due to the implementation of the buffer and the triggering system. But consider that this is only a 10 megahertz, very cheap oscilloscope. Achieving this fast update rate is definitely quite impressive. Now here's the moment everybody is waiting for. Let's find out whether the advertised 10 MHz bandwidth is accurate. I finally found my 50 ohm through BNC adapter here, and that will definitely make the measurement a lot more accurate. And also the DGE 2070 right now is set up as 50 ohm output impedance as well. Currently, you can see on the screen we're outputting a 1 MHz sinusoidal, and let me increase the frequency here. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. As you can see, the front end definitely supports 10 MHz, as right now the voltage is only dropping to about 0.9 volts. But because we have relatively slow sampling rate at a maximum of 48 mega samples per second, the waveform appears to be heavily distorted at this moment, which is actually to be expected. Let's try to see if we can set the time base a little faster. Actually, this uh, 100 nanoseconds per second is the fastest time base we can set. So let's uh, reduce the frequency a bit to see at 9 MHz. Yeah, 9 MHz is perfectly usable, and even at 10 is quite usable. So we can confidently say that the ZT702S definitely meets its spec 10 MHz bandwidth. Now let's test out the supplied probe here. And let's uh, hook it up to the test signal. See if we can acquire the signal here. All right. Again, the acquired signal is a little bit of a lowering amplitude. That is something I think can be fixed in firmware. Now let's uh, change it here, and uh, now let's try to adjust the compensation here. And that's 
pretty good. And do you hear a click? That is between 200 millivolts and 500 millivolts. That is where the input relay is switching between the ranges here. Now let's take a look at the single shot capability of this ZT702S. For that, I'm currently hooking the output from a power supply to the input of the oscilloscope probe. And you can see we set the trigger to be single shot mode and the triggering on the rising edge and its DC coupling. So let's uh, give it a go. And you can see we capture that signal beautifully. Once it's triggered, let's see if we can expand the horizontal to see a little bit more detail here. Change volt and time base. And you can see here currently the horizontal is at 20 milliseconds per division and we have zoomed in quite a bit. And as you can see here, even though the ZT702S only has 64 kilobytes of sample memory, you can still capture enough details for analyzing transient signals like what we have shown here. Now I played around in the oscilloscope mode a little bit more and found one potential issue here. That is, if you look at the signal right now on the screen here, that's a 1 MHz sinusoidal, and uh, so far so good. But if I reduce the vertical setting here, you will see that at some point, the waveform becomes heavily distorted and uh, is essentially not able to measure the actual waveform anymore. And this could potentially be an issue if you are just doing manual ranging because you are not able to actually see what's going on on the oscilloscope. But the good news here is you can always just press the auto range and it will essentially reacquire the signal and get back to the correct state. This is not a deal breaker per se, but uh, it's just something you need to be aware of. One thing I forgot to mention is that we actually have more choices to these menu options here. You can press the menu and we see some of these before, but if you scroll to the right, we also have the language, auto on off and backlight. And here we have this uh, more measurement button here. If you turn it on, it will add additional three measurements here. That is the minimum voltage, the RMS voltage, and also the period, which will definitely come in handy. Now, one thing I don't see here is the cursor measurement capability. In my opinion, they could have implemented that in the software, but uh, they chose not to. And that is really not a big deal, especially this is just a very casual single channel oscilloscope. But uh, nevertheless, it would be helpful if that feature is included. So let's move on to the next page of the menu here. And here you can see that we can do the calibration, we can do reset. The storage here actually is when you press this button, it will appear as a massive storage on the computer. So that is how you transfer the images you've taken on this oscilloscope to your computer. So that is quite neat. And uh, oh, by the look of it, once we move out of that uh, screen, somehow the settings are reset on this uh, oscilloscope. Anyway, let's uh, go to menu. Let's see what else we have. Now we also have the version number. And let's take a look at that uh, reset here. So I'm guessing that uh, the reset sets the meter into factory default. Let's go back to the menu and uh, let's take a look at the other one here. So let's take a look at auto off. 15 minutes, okay, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, and uh, two hours. Now we have it auto off, turned off. And the brightness of the backlight. So it seems that the default is 100%, but you can dim the backlight potentially to save some battery. Let's uh, move on to the next page here. Let's also try out the calibrate. Okay, don't input signal, and it's doing some calibration in the background here. And it does seem that that calibration process is quite involved. It took about uh, two minutes to finish, and in the meantime, you can hear the relay clicking for different ranges to calibrate each of the settings. And now it's time for us to take a look at the digital multimeter. 
The first thing I want to point out are these supplied probes. These probes are of decent quality. And if you look at it, especially the cables, they are relatively soft. Although these are not silicon, but uh, they are soft enough and they will definitely not get tangled. The tips for these probes are also relatively sharp, which are good if you are trying to probe the PCB and these are good to scrape off the oxidization layers. So that is uh, excellent. And now let's take a look at the performance of the multimeter here. So let's uh, switch to the multimeter mode. And the first thing you see is it defaults to DC voltage measurement and you can press this button and it will change to AC true RMS, which is excellent. So let's first measure some voltages. And by the way, the DC measurement range has an accuracy of uh, plus minus 0.5% plus three digits. For the DC measurement, I'm hooking up with my DC voltage standard from EDC, the model MV216A. So now let me output in one volt at a time. One volt, two volts, three volts, four, five. That's actually quite impressive. Everything seems to be bang on so far. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And because this is a 9,999 counts meter, you see that we do lose a digit once it exceeds 10 volts. And now let's take a look at 100 millivolts at a time. 100, 200, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and finally 1 volt. Yep, no problem at all. This meter, the display area, has a large portion dedicated to this bar graph, so I'm curious to see how fast the bar graph updates. And for that, I hooked the meter up to a variable power supply, and let me adjust the output voltage and see how fast the bar graph updates. Oh, it appears it actually does not update that fast at all. So it appears that the update rate actually is probably similar to the display update, which is spec'd at three times per second. I suppose the bar graph does give you some indication as to where you are in the current range, but that's about it. One excellent feature of this multimeter is that it has the maximum, minimum, and average displayed at all times. So you get a sense of uh, the variation of the input signal here. So you can see that the maximum voltage a while ago inputted was around 19.7 volts. Now let's take a look at the AC voltage measurements. For this test, the ZT702S is measuring the variax output and the readings are verified by the Unity UT61E+. And uh, by the way, the AC measurement accuracy for the ZT702S is spec'd at 1% plus 3 digits with a maximum measurement frequency up to 1 kilohertz. So let me ramp up the voltage here. And you will see that the readings between these two meters largely agree with each other. That's good. An update rate of this ZT702S is uh, fairly decent here as well. Of course, the bar graph, as we mentioned earlier, it doesn't really update that fast. And it seems that the high voltage warning turns on at 100 volts. It is a little bit of uh, arbitrary, but uh, the display text does turn red and indicating that you are working with dangerously high voltage here. But usually for other meters, that indicator turns on around 60 volts. Actually for the unit E, you can see here, it turns on at uh, around 30 volts. And I'll move on to the ohm measurement range. And you can see that the range switching is relatively slow for the outer range. Let's zero it out and see it again. By the way, this is actually pretty typical for a lot of the multimeters on the market. 
and we have a little bit of residual measurement value here and we can zero it out using the rail button and now we can measure a small resistance here this is a one ohm resistor you can see that we are roughly measuring one ohm now let's take a look at the 100 ohm resistor this is a precision resistor that is spec at 0.01 percent Uh, oh, I know what is happening. Because we just routed out, it seems that the relative measurement mode is only applicable to the lowest range. So that would be the ohm range up to 99.99 ohm. And in this case, we're right at the borderline. So we have to turn off the uh, rail mode, it seems. And also we change it to manual ranging. So we have to press and hold. And now we change it back to auto ranging. And you can see that we are pretty much bang on. And next, let's uh, do a measurement of a one mega ohm resistor. And by the way, this meter can measure up to 100 mega ohms, which is quite impressive. And no problem at all. And by the way, while you are doing measurement, you can also do manual ranging. All you do is uh, simply press the auto range button again, and you can see that you enter the manual ranging mode. So for that, for example, uh, let's see, we go back to the ohm mode and uh, you can measure the 100 ohm resistor and it doesn't go through the ranging actually. I need to do it one more time. It is definitely slightly faster versus when it has to do auto ranging to switch across a few different ranges. In my opinion, the rail button could have been implemented with both the 100 ohm and 1K range. And in that case, we would be able to measure that 100 ohm precision resistor with the rail button. And let's see, we can cycle through this is continuity. And let's take a look at how fast it does the continuity measurement. And it seems like it is latched and definitely no problem at all. And actually, this is pretty fast. Next is the diode measurement mode. And for that, let's test a white LED as a lot of meters having trouble with a white LED because of the forward voltage drop is greater than 2.5 volts. So let's see if we can light this LED up. Yep, we have no problem lighting it up. As you can see here, and we are measuring the forward voltage drop of 2.658 volts, which is excellent. Next, let's see the capacitance measurement mode. And uh, let's uh, use that to measure a 22 picofarad capacitor here. And you notice we already have some straight capacitance here. So let's try zero it out first. And you can see we're measuring 21 nanofarads. That is quite accurate here. Let's go straight into this uh, one millifarad capacitor here. And uh, let's see how fast it can measure. All right, so this is definitely taking quite a bit of time. So it's not ideal. As you can see here, it takes about five or six seconds before it stabilizes. And again, that's very typical for a lot of the multimeters, but nevertheless, this is definitely on the slower side. Next, let's take a look at the current measurement mode. And you do see that warning pop up very briefly, and that's to remind you to put the leads in the correct socket here. And that message only pops up once when you power on the device and switch into the current mode for the first time. So for example, right now, if I go back, you will not show that message again. So let's uh, put the lead into the milliamp measurement uh, socket here. Give me one second. And the first measurement we're gonna do is to measure this 100 microamp current standard here. Let's uh, take a look. Wait, why is it measuring 11 milliamp? 
Oh, 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 because right now we're in the amp range. But anyway, let's uh, change it to milliamp range here. Yeah. So the milliamp range is actually measuring correctly. And uh, that is interesting. So clearly this amp range is supposed to be when you put your leads in the 10 amp range. So this is actually very interesting that if the current measurement setting does not match the input jacks, it still shows you a reading, but that reading is actually wrong. Now, this issue can be addressed through hardware and firmware design. As for instance, if the measurement range is supposed to be in the milliamp range, the ADC input for the amp range jack can be shunted and vice versa. So I'm assuming that the design for this ZT702S, there's probably no separate signal path for each of the ranges, and therefore the ADC is just converting whatever is being presented. Now, this is unfortunate, but uh, probably there's some other constraints that prevented the designer from being able to separate these two different current measurement ranges. I'm not sure. And check this out. The same issue occurs in the amp range too. So right now I'm putting in a 5 amp current through this meter, and you can see that if we change it to the milliamp range, we're actually only measuring 45.12 milliamps, but in reality, this is actually a 5 amp current. So definitely, I think you need to pay a lot of attention when you are measuring current, as you must make sure that the input jacks match the current current range. Otherwise, the readings will be inaccurate. Another minor detail you will notice is that while in current measurement mode, actually the amp and milliamp would take up these last two positions, where if you remembered, the last one actually used to be for millivolts and uh, temperature measurement. So in order to get to that setting, you have to get out of the current measurement and then go back in. And now let's take a look at that dedicated millivolt range. And for that, I'm going to hook up the EDC voltage standard again, and this time I'm putting it into millivolt mode as well. This range is very sensitive, so I have it powered on the voltage reference and uh, let it sit for a while. So now we're showing exactly zero millivolts. So let me now put in one nanovolt to see if we can register that. And uh, we're not seeing anything. Let's do two nanovolts. Three, four, five. Yeah, it seems we can definitely register that five nanovolts. If we go any lower, let's see, four, no we're not able to register four nanovolts. So it seems that the sensitivity is at about five nanovolts. And this is five, let's do six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Yeah, keep in mind that in the nanovolts range, it is very sensitive. So this is actually pretty good at what it can measure here. Now let's uh, do 10 at a time. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. And we do 100 at a time. 0.1. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and finally one millivolt. And this millivolt range can measure up to 99.99 millivolts. And of course, with a supplied thermal couple, you can use this uh, range to measure the temperature as well. So let's uh, switch to temperature measurement. How do I get to Fahrenheit? It doesn't seem I'm able to get to Fahrenheit. Huh, that's interesting, because it certainly says F there, but uh, you can see that we can only go to, by the look of it, Celsius. But anyway, let's uh, take a look here and clearly we are able to measure the temperature. Oh, 
the temperature reading actually has both Celsius and Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit is in this small print, but I would have expected we could use the range button to actually switch the actual display to Fahrenheit, but not a big deal. Now it's time for the teardown. Wow, the back cover is actually held together with these four machine screws with these uh, inserts instead of using self-tappers. And if you look at the back cover here, you will see that they are these moldings for increased rigidity. Well, job well done here. And by the look of it, this whole thing is powered by this single lithium ion battery. And before we proceed any further, let's actually measure the power consumption here. I'm currently using the bench power supply to supply the 4.2 volts and the AN870 is measuring the current. And currently we're in microamp range. You can see that the standby current for this meter is actually at just under one microamp it is 0.75, which is actually quite decent. And now let me change to amp range and we'll power on the meter here. Now we're powered on. It's in oscilloscope mode. You can see we're drawing about uh, just over 300 milliamps. And that's actually not bad. Now this battery is, let's see here, it's 7.4 watt hour. So that is 2000, oh yeah, it's printed right here. It's 2000 milliamp hours. So this will last you about six hours. So that's a decent amount of runtime. And let's uh, switch it to the multimeter mode. We're drawing about the same amount of current. So roughly the current consumption is just over 300 milliamps. Here on this side of the board, the circuitry is probably largely just a DMM section. As you can see, here is our DMM chip. And by look of it, the marking is DM1109EN. And I couldn't find much information of this chip on the internet, but that's our DMM. And it's a 10,000 counts or 9,999 counts digital multimeter chip. And here is our EEPROM that is used for storing the configurations of the multimeter. And that's quite common amongst a lot of the multimeter implementations that we have seen before. And just slightly to the left here, I just noticed this chip, that's a TP4056. And that's a battery charging chip for the lithium ion battery on board. And towards the right, back to the DMM section, we can see the two ceramic fuses. These are for the milliamp range and uh, amp range. And you can see we have this additional via stitched PCB footprint here. And this is for increased current carrying capability. And that definitely is well designed here. Now, if you notice the input, again, as most of the Chinese digital meters, we don't really have a lot of input protection here. And the only thing I can see is this uh, lonely PTC sitting here, and there's no MOFs. We also have this uh, resistive divider here that is for the input potentially to handle the high voltage input. And uh, that's about it. And of course, we have a few, by the look of it, transistor clamps for the input section protection. And of course, we have this relay to switch the different ranges. Now, if you recall earlier, we saw that the milliamp range and amp range, somehow we can measure both from both of the inputs and that caused some confusion on the display. And one way to implement that, you could have a physical switch, for example, another relay to switch between the different ranges, depends on which range the multimeter is currently. In. For example, in milliamp range, you will switch off the amp range input and vice versa. Of course, you can also do that on the ADC side, but for whatever reason, we don't have that in this meter here. And I'm curious to see what the cat rating is on this meter. I forgot to check earlier, let's see. Well, it said it's a uh, CAT4 600 volts and CAT3 1000 volts. Clearly, by the look of it, it doesn't really meet that standard. And that is kind of common among a lot of the Chinese meters we have reviewed. And just keeping that in mind, when you are doing electronics work, that is perfectly fine. But if you're doing electrical work, especially in those uh, powerful industrial settings, this is definitely not a meter I would recommend. Now. If you also look at here, 
uh, let me just zoom in a little bit more here. I'm not sure if you can see here. The gaps between the traces are fairly close, and this one is actually right next to the screw here, and that's actually our input. Let's see what input that is. Yeah, that's the voltage input. In normal situations, you probably will be fine, but uh, if you are inputting really up to a thousand volts, and for whatever reason, there is a little bit of uh, insulation problem on the board, you would cause a arc between the input and the rest of the circuitry, and that will cause a big problem here. But other than that, it looks pretty neat. Everything is uh, well laid out, and uh, there's no botch whatsoever. Now let's see what else we can see on this side. And here is our USB input. And I'm sure the circuitry is probably on the other side as there is nothing on this side. And also we haven't seen the application processor yet, so I'm sure it is hiding on the other side of the board. And this is our input BNC jack, and this is probably just the front end. There's a shielding can, uh, it's soldered down, okay. And uh, this ribbon is probably going back to the LCD. So we have two of these components here, not entirely sure what it is. Uh, this one could potentially be a converter of some sort, but you can see that we clearly have two separate grounds here. This is the side for the, I'm guessing, the oscilloscope portion, and this side is for the digital multimeter portion. I guess we'll have to take it apart a little bit more before we can see the other side, so let me do that. Well, it's a little bit underwhelming. The LCD here, you can see that it's just a LCD. And once it comes off, this is actually all the circuitry underneath it. By the look of it, we do have this application processor that is an artery. I assume it's a ARM Cortex series, as we have seen before in other devices that we have done teardown with. But unfortunately, the marking is scraped off, and I don't know exactly what that is. Now here is the companion memory that is used to store the program that runs the user interface. And on the other side we can see there is a external voltage reference that is ICL8069D, which is a 100 ppm 1.23 volts nominal voltage voltage reference. Now some multimeter chips actually use a built-in voltage reference, but for this one it uses an external one. And at 100 ppm tempo, that is actually a pretty decent voltage reference. I was debating whether to take the shielding cans off or not, but you can see here these are soldered in, and uh, the one at the bottom also, by the look of it, was soldered in at least at one, two, three, four, five, five different spots. So I decided not to, and also I found that on Dave's EV block, he already did a teardown of this meter. Actually, in his meter, the chip was not sent it off. So if you are interested in see what is underneath here, you can hop over to Dave's channel and check that video out. And if you watch Dave's video, you will see there is a dedicated ADC inside that supports the 48 max samples per second sampling. But there's no dedicated sampling memory, and the sampling memory is inside this ARM Cortex processor. So overall, this meter is surprisingly capable considering the price point. The oscilloscope design is excellent for a 10 MHz bandwidth scope. The waveform update rate is fast, and single shot worked really well. Although it doesn't have any of the fancy measurement features, the implementation is still very good for an entry-level hobbyist's portable oscilloscope. And a 10 thousand counts multimeter, although it is by no means fast and also has some minor design flaws, it nevertheless is a very capable multimeter. And for the price you pay, the ZT702S is certainly an excellent handheld oscilloscope and a multimeter to have. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you liked the video, please don't forget to give it a big thumbs up and remember to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. I will catch up the next time.